Um, it's uh, been a huge pleasure to be part of this project of the Fabian Society. Um, we've really, really enjoyed uh, both the, the process of learning so much about the subject with amazing site visits and talking to businesses and workers, uh, and of course, all the hard work of coming up with the recommendations. But the project would not have been possible without the support of community who are a, a partner in the in the delivery of the project, but also uh, were the main financial support of the project. And it just wouldn't have been possible without them. And of course, the access that they brought us to their members and uh, you know shop floor um, representatives and stewards who gave us the real you know sort of if you like the granular insight that was so important for this project. So our first speaker, I'm delighted to welcome the General Secretary of Community uh, and one of our Commission members, uh, Roy Rickhouse. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, thank you for that introduction. And can I thank you uh, for chairing um, tonight's event and all the fellow, uh, fellow commissioners that are here uh, tonight for all the hard work that has gone into producing the report. Um, a little bit of background, I just want to say why community decided to initiate uh, and support the, the commission uh, and why we were thinking about these issues even before COVID. Uh, rapidly changed the world of work, possibly uh, forever. And you're right, Andrew, that none of us could foresee what was going to happen when we started out what seems to be uh, a while ago uh, in terms of the work that we were doing. Um, I joined the trade union many years ago, and obviously all of us in the trade union movement have seen many changes uh, in, the, in the world of work over the years. And, and, and as, as, as trade union sort of leaders, we try to prepare our members for, for that change. And I'm proud of, of, of that my union is, is seen as, as, a, as a modern uh, union for what is a, a changing world. Um, so I believe it's really important that we take on the questions of automation. Um, and it's become even more pressing, uh, I suppose, in the light of the COVID crisis, as we help workers to prepare for, for the future. And that's part of, of what is the fabric uh, of our union. Well, we know the best way to equip for the future is not by trying to prevent change, but by preparing for it. And we see that as our responsibility to ensure working people can re reap the rewards of automation and be prepared for the positive opportunities it can bring. That's why we worked with the Fabian Society, Yvette Cooper, and a fantastic team of commissioners to lead the investigation into how we ensure that the use of technology in workplaces creates more good quality jobs across the economy and country and does not sharpen inequalities. Part of the research, I think Andy mentioned, we undertook a number of workplace visits, uh, focus groups, evidence hearings, and interviews with workers. But we felt the involvement of working people should be absolutely central to this report, that the work be focused on what workers think and feel about the future. And again, we're proud that the report has had working people at the very heart of it uh, and right the way through. So the report tries to set out a vision for how we can work together to shape uh, the future, how we can ensure workers have a voice in technology change, receive a fair share in the rewards, and make certain nobody feels left behind in the wake of the potential disruption caused by COVID and automation. So briefly to the report it itself, I hope you agree that we tried to capture the main issues we found during the research uh, phase. And as such, the report uh, probably has four main sections and, and some of the speakers will probably speak in more detail on those sections as we go through this evening's event. Um, the, the first thing I think we should say is the importance of workers' voices in decision-making not just in, in and at the workplace, but within government bodies that create the industrial strategy and the policies. And as unions, we have to seek to influence uh, whoever uh, is, is in government. I think it's interesting that we've seen throughout this crisis how unions have responded, working with all stakeholders, not just to protect workers, uh, but also to ensure that if, if they have to keep continue working, which large uh, a large part of the public sector and, and industry has had to, that they can do so uh, safely 
and, and work um, as keep the economy going as best as possible. So the contributions from unions has been acknowledged. We've even had praise and thanks from secretaries of states and ministers. So for us, it would be unacceptable and actually simply plain stupid not to continue the dialogue uh, in other areas such as automation, having recognised the role unions can play. Giving workers a fair share of the rewards, rewards automation may bring, particularly where this leads to increased productivity. But that fair share is not just about the workplace. It's about places, regions, sectors, through devolved powers, no part of the country should ever feel left behind. A better work experience, good work standards, particularly in sectors that are not well unionized. And the final section of the report, and possibly the most important, we cannot achieve a better future without the education, training, upskilling, and preparing people to take on potentially new roles. So those are the headings. I hope you find time to read the report in more detail, and I hope you agree that it sets out a compelling vision for ways that we can start to build the future. Thank you. Go on mute, Andrew. I'm so sorry. Um, as you can see, Yvette has joined us, so I will be able to turn to her as our second speaker. Now, some commissions of this sort have um, high profile figurehead chairs who uh, barely touch the project. And I have to say, this has not been the case on this project. Yvette really has led and steered it at every stage. And uh, the recommendations really have benefited from her time, uh, of course, in opposition, but also as a former senior minister who had to lead some of these responses during the last major economic crisis we faced. Yvette, uh, delighted that you can join us and please give a little overview of the, the project and the report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. And apologies for being late at the beginning. We've just been voting. Um, and so I don't think there's going to be another division bell um, for another hour, but but you never know. So apologies for that. Can I just start by just saying a massive thank you to the Fabians and to community for backing this, for setting this project up at the beginning, for believing in it and for the immense amount of work that they have done to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I've seen the huge amount of research, the huge amount of organisation that has gone into this at every stage to make this a really substantial report. The fact that there's sort of 31 detailed recommendations, but also uh, detailed research and, you know, very much as Roy has said, hearing workers' voices at the heart of it, the fact that we have been around the country, two different workplaces, listening to people, and the, the determination and the, the dedication that's gone in from the Fabians and community is what's made that possible. But I also wanted to thank all of the commissioners because we've had this sort of commissioners from all kinds of different backgrounds and experience whose, um, whose uh, contributions to this report has made it what it is and hugely grateful to everyone which for something which has been a several year commitment uh, to get it to this point. Obviously when we started none of us had even heard of COVID, frankly 12 months ago none of us had even heard of COVID and we started this in a very different situation. We, we have always believed, I think all of the commissioners, in the huge potential of technology, the huge benefits that changing technology can bring to help us build a fairer, greener, uh, stronger economy and society, the, to see the benefits, the wealth, the prosperity, the productivity improvements that new technology can bring. But our starting point had been, what does this look like from workers' point of view? And what are the risks that technology can widen inequality rather than narrow it? That different people can end up being left behind, not getting a fair share in the benefits of new technology, and particularly that working people were not seeing a fair share or the fair rewards. And our starting point was, right, what do we need to do to sort that? We've seen in past waves of technology throughout history, 
where ways of technology have brought new wealth and prosperity, but it hasn't been evenly shared, that we've also seen new exploitation and new inequalities, and it has taken generations in the past to deliver the institutions like the trade union movement or the welfare state that has then responded to and dealt with those injustices and helped better share the rewards from new technology. This time, we can't afford to wait for uh, several generations, we can't afford to wait many years in order to make sure that the benefits of new technology are fairly shared. But add to that, obviously came the COVID crisis and that created two big new challenges. First, of course, that the backdrop to any changes in technology is so much more difficult. The backdrop in terms of the economy, in terms of the kinds of restrictions all on our lives, in terms of the opportunities for someone who might lose their job because of automation to get a new job at a time with rising unemployment becomes so much more difficult. But then we've also seen COVID accelerate automation as well. Technology has helped save jobs during this crisis. It has undoubtedly helped through making possible remote working, remote shopping, remote learning, uh, even remote speeches in Parliament. It's helped make possible all of those things and has helped save jobs and save businesses and livelihoods in the process. However, the acceleration of technology is also accelerating the job replacing automation, which means that many of those jobs now may not come back. So the fact that people who switch to online shopping may not go back to the high street for very many of the things that they buy, and therefore those retail workers jobs may just not come back, even when the shops are allowed to open. The fact that people have switched to online ordering, online booking their accommodation, online ordering food in a, in a pub or a restaurant, all of those kinds of things can end up bringing in the automation that can also replace jobs at a time when we're not seeing new jobs being created and when it's working people who are most at risk. And of course, low paid workers who are at the greatest risk of all. Low paid workers time and again, we see being hardest hit. And what we've identified as being a double whammy to particularly low paid workers, to retail and hospitality workers, but also other workers across the economy, including some areas around manufacturing, other areas of distribution as well. And the research that uh, Josh and others at the Fabians and Luca at the Fabians had done showed that of the 61% of furloughed workers, so that's those who've seen their jobs suspended this year because of COVID, were in the highest um, risk sectors for automation. So that means for those workers, they're being hit twice. Jobs suspended this year because of COVID, but jobs that may not return next year because of the accelerating pace of automation. Throughout crises in economic crises in the past or economic shocks in the past, you often see an acceleration of technology take up acceleration of automation. And that is certainly what we are seeing in this crisis. But that means government has to respond to that. And whilst we have seen the government responding to the, for example, the partnership working between the trade unions, the TUC and the CBI and early on in the crisis to develop the furlough scheme, for example, it has been very much short term based on the short term COVID crisis, not thinking about the interaction between the COVID crisis and these longer term challenges. So, for example, the fact that so many furlough work, furloughed workers this year have not had any training. People who've been off work for months on end and have not actually had the chance during that time to be able to increase their skills, to be able to make the most of the online learning that we know is possible. So a huge missed opportunity already, but also a really dangerous failure to meet those opportunities in future and a really serious risk that we are going to see widening inequality and also see long term structural unemployment unless action is taken. So the many recommendations that we've set out, some of them are about the short term and about the how we respond to the COVID crisis in the short term. Others, as Roy has said, about some of the longer term 
recommendations most immediately about making sure those furloughed workers get training right now, making sure that there are job guarantees, work and train guarantees for the unemployed to prevent anybody reaching long term unemployment, support to expand and create new jobs in the middle of the crisis, and also then some of the expansion of the free training and education, some of the longer term measures that we talked about, about an overhaul of adult skills to help people adapt, measures to also make sure the rewards are fairly shared, expanding collective bargaining around technology as well, including that. The sort of sectoral partnerships, having the um, trade unions and employers and government working together with small businesses representatives, with the self-employed representatives on a sector by sector basis to draw up proper industrial policies for the future that can support uh, businesses to adopt new technology that can help boost productivity, but also do so in a way that helps also uh, support jobs and support people to get new jobs. And crucially, as Roy said, at the heart of this, making sure workers have a stronger voice. Because time and again, in workplaces we went to around the country and some of the focus groups that we heard from, we heard cases where workers have been really frustrated where new technology had been adopted that actually didn't even work very well, that they weren't involved in, that wasn't having the desired impact, that they felt alienated from and they weren't getting the training or support they needed either to get the new jobs alongside that technology or to get alternative jobs as well. But we also saw some great examples where we saw workers and um, given a proper voice where we saw employers and trade unions working together. We went, for example, to the ASDA distribution uh, uh, center in my constituency um, in Castleford where we saw where the trade union and employers had been working together to make sure that the new technology that was introduced improved health and safety, delivered productivity improvements and also got the workers a pay rise. And so <coughs> we've seen those good examples. We know the benefits that technology can bring. We know the opportunities that it can bring, whether it's in the COVID crisis or beyond. But we've also seen the problems and we've seen the risks to inequality, the risks to places as well as to people where some places end up losing out whilst uh, not being able to share in the benefits of technology and just seeing the costs and the consequences. We can't wait to just see the consequences and the problems and then try and put it right later on. We have a responsibility to put it right now. And that is, I think, the, the huge and, and important agenda that Fabians and community through the, the Changing Work Centre have managed to put together uh, through this commission. And again, just a huge thank you to everybody that's been part of it and everybody that's been putting forward the uh, important recommendations. I just have one final thought. It just occurred to me that one final thing that I think um, is worth drawing out. Sometimes people just think about the, the technology and high tech jobs of the future and, and new technology jobs and how you help people in low skilled jobs get the skills to get the high tech uh, jobs of the future. Actually, if you're really thinking about tackling inequality in the future, you also recognize that there are certain kinds of jobs where that are going to expand that are not technology based jobs, but they are still immensely important in our economy. For example, the caring jobs, care worker jobs and key worker jobs that we've seen as being so central in the COVID crisis. And we don't value those jobs enough. And so the danger of the polarization in the future is that while some of the high tech, high skilled jobs may see new rewards from technology, some of those low qualified jobs, some of the caring jobs that are immensely important end up continuing to be undervalued and underpaid. And we see the polarization and widening inequality. So alongside all the support to help workers get new skills, we also actually have to start rejigging our economy and valuing caring, valuing the kinds of new caring jobs of the future as well. I'll finish there, Andy, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you weren't on the call when I said to everyone that we'd really love people to write in uh, questions and answers, questions into the Q&A function, but we'd also love uh, Yvette, you and other commissioners to have a go at answering them in writing, um, as we won't have a huge amount of time for back and forth at the end. So um, put your questions to Yvette in the Q&A and we'll see uh, if she or others want to reply to them. Um, I'm going to now go through uh, each of the commissioners on the call um, and ask them just to bring a few moments of personal reflection on the commission. You know, Joe, we're not asking for 
uh, a huge sort of like list of all the recommendations, but just one or two things that really strike them from the whole project, from the visits and the research, and also the contents of the final report. And I'm going to start with Sue Ferns, who is from Prospect Union. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thanks to you, the Fabian Society and community for uh, enabling me to be part of this really interesting and important uh, piece of work and to Yvette for chairing it. Um, I'm old enough to remember and have experienced the malaise of structural unemployment in the 1980s. And I think, therefore, I particularly welcome the fact that this report sets out the case for an interventionist labour market and industrial strategy, and crucially one that reduces inequality and promotes good work. Uh, there's lots of talk about it, but industrial strategy really does matter. The report talks, for example, about the importance of green and digital skills. It talks about the immediate potential, uh, for example, in ret retrofitting for energy efficiency and so on. Um, and actually, this launch is incredibly well timed, given that last week we had the report of the Committee on Climate Change, which illustrated actually the huge industrial shift that we are going to need to make in order to achieve net zero. And yesterday we had the energy white paper. And this won't all be about high skilled jobs. It will be about jobs at a range of different skill levels. Um, but it's essential that we do meet this challenge and that the process of change for all of those involved is fair and inclusive. Uh, now, Prospect, my union, is working on another project with community, um, which will show when we publish it early in the new year, that that process of fair change, or to use the jargon, just transition, is essential not only for climate change, but also to manage the changes that are going to be brought about by the introduction of, introduction of new technology, AI, and also that response to COVID-19. So for me, um, I reflect on the importance of that and the timeliness of it. And again, just emphasize that a fair change is one that leads to good quality jobs, that reduces inequality, and crucially, as the report says, in a number of recommendations, has worker voice at the heart of it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Um, and next I'm gonna to turn to Paul Novak, who's the Deputy General Secretary of the TUC. Well, thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the opportunity um, to say a few words and echo uh, the thanks that's already been given to the Fabian Society and community for the, uh, for the work that's gone into the report. But in particular, everybody who works in those two organizations, and probably most importantly, the workers who inputted into the, uh, the deliberations of the commission, as Yvette said, going into workplaces, talking to people about their real first-hand uh, experience. I, I mean, for me, what was important about the report was we took as our starting point um, the sense that the shape of the future of our economy, uh, the shape of the future of our society is not in some way predetermined. We know that technological change is inevitable, but we also know that what we do as politicians, as policymakers, as employers, as trade unions, as consumers can make a big difference uh, in shaping uh, our future and, and, and can feed into these big questions about who benefits from technological change how we ensure that it's a force for, for, for progress rather than a force uh, for reaction. And I think that's been at the heart of all the work that unions have done consistently right throughout their history, 150 years or more, not just reacting to the changing world of work, but I think where we're at our best, we're helping to shape the future of the world of work uh, with our members, their families uh, and communities. And I suppose for me, um, lots of really good stuff in the report, that section on how we put workers at the heart of this big industrial transition is really important. So that that means, for example, making sure that we embed, as Yvette talked about before, a genuine approach to social partnership right throughout uh, our economy and labour market at workplace level, but through uh, uh, through a sectoral level at national level uh, as well. It means empowering trade unions to be able to effectively represent their members. And the report talks about how we can remove some of the practical barriers uh, to unions to organise and represent uh, workers. But also I think places an onus on us as, as unions as well to get into workplaces and negotiate agreements with employers that support our members through these industrial transitions, to reach out into those new and growing parts of the economy where we're not so strong at the moment, particularly part of the private uh, service sector. So, I mean, as a trade unionist, I'm, I'm an optimist by heart, uh, but I think that the report gives us lots of practical um, action points to build on at every level in workplaces 
in the political process to actually make sure that this next coming wave of industrial transition is one that works for working people and their families. Thanks, Paul. Um, and the next commission I'm going to call is Katie O'Donovan from, uh, from Google UK. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be here uh, this afternoon. I, I mean, the, the point has already been made, but um, the timeliness of this commission was put into kind of stark relief, I think, by the, um, the last year. And I was thinking, you know, where do I see myself and how do I see myself working by the end of the next year, 2021? I can't really imagine that. And I, I think probably most of us on the call fail to struggle to think what that will look like and, ha and how we'll be working. And then when you add in, you know, if you're thinking and considering that from a point of view of a sector that's at risk or that, um, you know, you're later on in your career or you're not given training as, as a vet signaled earlier, it really does make clear why this report is needed so much now. Um, and I think, you know, the, the reasons it's needed now are, are, are much sharper than they were when we started. But I think the reason that Google was so keen to be involved at the beginning is that often when we talk about these issues, there's a kind of a digital or a technological exceptionalism, which is, oh, this is the future. This is just too difficult for us to grasp. You know, we're not quite sure what to do. But actually, I think the Fabians were really brave and, and community too in saying, no, actually, you know, as ever, if we bring together policymakers, if we bring together academics, if we bring together businesses and technology and unions and workers, we can actually have a good idea at what we should be doing in the future and, and come up with some really practical recommendations, which I think is, is really clear in the report today. So um, thank you to the team that have worked so hard on it. Well done, Josh. And it's it's been really good being part of that. Um, I think we don't need to wait as well until there's kind of final agreement on everything that's recommended in a report like this. We can all get on and, and start playing our parts already. And I think it's great to again, be working with commissioners that are so busy doing that. Um, and so for Google, I mean, <laughs> What does that mean? It means actually making sure that people can access and use our products and nearly all of them are free and relatively easy to use. But it also means making sure we're part of a wider societal effort to train people and make sure that they feel empowered and have agency over the technology that's available to them. Um, and we actually started about four or five years ago a programme that decided we, we wouldn't do it all virtually and online. We would get um, out into the community. We, we started our first one in Leeds, a digital garage programme, and have trained about 300,000 people since then, very much reaching for people who aren't the technology first. They're not in the kind of white heat of the tech revolution, but are thinking perhaps I could do more, or perhaps I could do my job differently, or perhaps I need to retrain. So obviously we've had to go online over the last year and we're not doing that in-person training, but we've had a couple of successful partnerships in particularly with the DWP um, who found real great demand for this and we've been able to partner with them, which has been so important. So I think um, I really welcome the practical element of this report, the clear recommendations. I know, you know, everyone on this call will be passionate about bringing them to realization i think for a company like ours what we need to do is say look you know we can have a, a, a significant impact over here but actually if we're convened by government or convened by others us companies like us working in partnership with unions and other employees can really achieve more so very much welcome the conversation and the deep work that's gone into this thanks katie um and uh unusually in the report there is uh, a page of recommendations but then there's a second page of uh, actions for employers and unions so that we don't want it just to be passed to politicians to solve this problem. We want uh, employers and unions and business organisations to be taking steps together right now. And um, the, the Josh who everyone keeps referring to is uh, the project's researcher, Josh Aby. And I just want to pay uh, from my own personal perspective, a huge uh, thanks to him. He's really been the sort of the linchpin of this project running the secretariat. Uh, but also a much wider team at uh, the Fabians and at Community, who have all part, been a huge part, and indeed in Yvette Cooper's office, all been a huge part of the project. Now I'm going to turn to our final commissioner, and uh, this commissioner has made a massive contribution to the project. Um, the sort of the um, academic um, heart, the expertise uh, that has really uh, brought uh, fantastic knowledge and rigour to the process, and that's uh, Professor Margaret Stevens from Oxford University. Margaret. 
Thank you, Andrew. Um, I was enormously grateful for the opportunity to take part in this project um, because the, it's such an important question. The pace of technological change affecting our working lives is, is unprecedented. And all of us um, thinking workers, employers, managers, educators, policymakers, we all need to think about how uh, we as individuals and society as a whole can adjust and adapt to the new types of work and, and ways of working. So when I began my research on the economics of vocational training, which was about 30 years ago, we thought of education and training as something that happened at the beginning of a working life and people would acquire skills then that would take them into their chosen career and last a lifetime. And we know now it's just not like that anymore. The challenge now is completely different. So as technology changes, the skills that, we, that are needed to change and we need an employment and in training culture that allows people um, in collaboration with employers to acquire and develop new skills as the old ones become um, less useful, less relevant, perhaps obsolete. So although our visits and discussions through the work of the Commission have revealed difficult problems and challenges, they've also been very encouraging, I think, because we've seen some inspiring examples of employers, employees and unions working constructively together to implement changes in technology and working patterns. So Yvette mentioned um, the ASDA um, example, um, and there are other case studies in the report, Siemens Congleton, um, Zurich Insurance, where we also saw um, some really fantastic uh, uh, um, examples that uh, um, show how uh, the benefits of technological progress can be shared. So we know it can be done. And what we need is a, a policy framework to spread that kind of good practice widely. So for me, the, the most exciting part of the report is um, almost a blueprint for uh, uh, an integrated adult skills system built around this idea of a national digital skills service um, to support people to train and adapt whenever they need to do so during their working lives. There have been so many government training initiatives over the years. We don't need to throw all that away and start again. What we need to do is to bring the system together as a partnership between people and employers and government and make it accessible to everyone. And I think that this report shows the first stop steps on the way to doing that. Margaret, thanks so much. Um, so I am going to try to bring uh, people who have asked questions in on the chat. And if you've been on one of these calls before, you'll know that occasionally we try to bring people in and it doesn't work. And then I have to read out their question. But uh, my aim is to get you to ask your own question. The first person I want to bring in is um, Harriet Bigby. Uh, Harriet, do you want to ask your question? Sorry. Harriet, are you able to go ahead? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Lovely. Sorry, that was a surprise. Um, my question essentially relates to how you deal with training for people looking to move in their careers. So, for example, entry level jobs often require prior experience, which therefore isn't an entry level job. And in order to get a new job, you're often required to show that you can already complete that exact role without the investment and support from the new company to actually help you grow. So you can only ever move uh, side to side, you can't move up. And whilst there is a risk of not being able to move up, you're then stuck at the at-risk roles that can be um, overtaken by automation. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and then we're going to go for Stephen Hesling. Um, Stephen, can you make yourself heard? Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. Um, my question was just around the the base of, of obviously knowledge, um, knowledge based work, as you know, the technology seems to be concentrated in large cities, um, where there are high concentrations of knowledge workers and companies that can take advantage of this. How do we ensure that workers in small cities and towns are not disadvantaged and left further, be further behind other parts of the country? And then I'm going to bring in um, Arik Chowdhury. Uh, Arik, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yes. Um, my question is, did the Commission come across uh, and or highlight good examples from history of policy interventions 
which successfully alleviated the negative effects of automation? If so, what can we learn from these? That's brilliant. So I'm not going to bring in all the commissioners uh, at this round of questions, but I do just want to turn to Yvette because actually I know you're interested in all three of those questions, but you particularly brought a perspective on towns to the project. Yes, um, I have um, at, at intervals driven um, Andrew mad by just suddenly in the middle of something just banging on about towns. Um, again, and I'll confess constituency interest in this. So I think this is a really big issue and we found evidence, have seen uh, separate evidence we didn't cover in this report of in the first five years after the financial crisis, cities grew, so their employment growth and their economic growth at about twice the level of that in towns on average. And certainly for those kinds of knowledge jobs, particularly concentrated around universities, but also around um, bigger cities as well. And we've also seen where cities have more diverse economies too. They're less likely to be affected by something happening, you know, some sort of automation change that affects a particular sector or a particular industry because they've got a much wider range of different kinds of jobs and the potential for creating new technology jobs. Whereas towns can be more exposed and can be more dependent um, on um, a particular sector, but can also find that they... Um, can't don't have the, the knowledge jobs i think that's why we've had a particular recommendation about having more investment in towns and also plans for towns a proper strategy for towns which includes jobs in towns skills in towns particularly because it's those towns that end up not having the high skilled workers can also struggle more to attract the new investment but also about connections to other places connections to cities connections to other places but I think that some of the technology acceleration we've seen as a result of the COVID crisis, so some of the remote working acceleration also raises actually some new opportunities for towns in terms of technology providing opportunities because actually knowledge workers can work from towns and still be part of huge knowledge networks and with part of um, considerably more remote working as well. But in order to do that, they need digital infrastructure. And very often, each time you get a new wave of digital infrastructure, it's rolled out in cities first and towns end up coming much further down the track. So investing in skills, in digital infrastructure in towns, in connections for towns with other areas, and then also in the kind of social and environmental investment that also makes towns nice places to be and to live uh, for people who may be working remotely in all kinds of different ways, and then I would say finally that point I was making at the end about we also have to value the kinds of key worker jobs, some of the, the jobs that other people might refer to as foundational economy jobs, and actually that will be in every town, you know, the care worker jobs in every town and across the country and every community across the country, and not see those as being the, the low skilled, ever more poorly paid jobs and instead should start valuing those as well. Thanks a bit. Um, Paul, do you, you want me to cover to... the others or do you want me to just cover No, that no Paul wanted to come in on uh, Harriet's question. Yeah, just quickly on Harriet's question. I think it was reflecting some of the other uh, uh, questions in, in the chat as well. I mean, I think there are three things which are all actually part of the report which would help. I, I mean, the first one is is providing uh, government providing proper financial support for those particularly on low incomes or insecure contracts to retrain. And we talk in the report about you know universal credit to support part-time working and part-time learning uh, you know proper uh, statutory training pay and training allowances but things that recognize the reality that for lots of low paid workers the ability to retrain is not just about getting access to a course it's about the financial support to be able to to take time out and do that second thing is about giving people access to proper careers advice and guidance right throughout their working lives not just at the start of their working lives and again in the report, we talk about a national support service that would help people plan their careers, access training, really important. And the third thing is, I, I, I don't think you can underestimate the value of having somebody independent at work to support you, to, to understand what opportunities are out there and to give you that advice uh, and support. And union learning reps play that role day in, day out in workplaces. Um, the, you know, the government has taken the decision incredibly short-sighted, and we reference this again in the report to withdraw funding for the union learning fund but that's a piece of work that supports 200,000 learners a year plus to access new training and learning opportunities through their union and employer uh, working together and that's a sort of independent support and advice that government should be supporting in workplaces up and down the country. That's great um, we'll go to some more questions I think we should uh, 
try and answer Eric's question in a moment as well. But let me bring in Paul Edwards Shea. Paul, do you want to ask your question? Hi there. Huh? Um, well, I was at school, I wasn't particularly academic. And uh, I think at that stage, um, careers weren't actually thought about very much. I was, uh, they thought I should become an, uh, a librarian. I eventually worked in software engineering for a long while. Uh, and that job didn't exist when I was at school. So with things like the Green Industrial Revolution and the New Green Deal, what jobs do the panel think will exist when school children day enter the workforce? Well, that's a great, a great speculative question. I'll see if uh, people were up to answering that. And um, next, I'm going to bring in uh, Joe Dromi, who is actually one of the witnesses that we heard from uh, in the early stages of the Commission's work. Thanks very much, and congratulations on an excellent report. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a bit more about, um, so the, the current skill system uh, kind of perversely seems to entrench inequalities rather than addressing it. So if you did well at school, uh, if you get uh, high levels of qualification, if you're a high paid worker, you're more likely to have an employer who invests in your skill and your skills, and you're more likely to be able to access other forms of learning. Whereas it's the people who could benefit most from training and upskilling opportunities who are least likely to take part. Um, so, so can you say a bit more about the, what your suggestions are for kind of reversing that trend and making sure that those who could most benefit from access to upskilling are, are supported to do so? Great. And there's another skills related question from Tim Peters. So I'll bring that in and then I'll go back to the panel. Tim, do you want to ask your question? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, really, it was just a, an identification that there, there are a number of different online service providers who offer lots of educational courses, but they're, they're frequently chargeable. And I wondered whether the, the panel had looked at the opportunities, perhaps, for making citizen level access available. Great. Um, Margaret, do you want to pick up any of those questions you've heard and respond to some of them? Yes, maybe, maybe the, the, the questions about uh, examples of, of, of policy interventions. Um, not, not so much actually, in, in specifically in relation to good examples of how to address the challenges of automation, but good, good examples of, of how to um, uh, embed really successful training. And, and I think that goes back to um, the, uh, uh, the 1970s and 80s when the industrial training boards, which were sectoral boards, which um, looked at the particular skills needs of different sectors and supported different kinds of training systems, depending on, on, on what was required in different sectors. And I think there are quite a lot of lessons there for us now. The importance of, 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 of reaching um, different solutions for different problems. Um, and, in, and that relates to localities, uh, the particular needs of particular areas. One area will be different from another because uh, the workers there have different skills and the employers there need different skills and matching those together um, is, is, is what it's about. So devolving the decision making in the way that uh, was done through the industrial training boards, I think needs to be part of the, um, the strategy now. Yeah, and there's a big flavour in the report on both devolving to sectors and to places, um, some of these key decisions. Um, Yvette, do you want to just pick up a little on the, the skills side of the report that a couple of those questions asked about? Yeah, I mean, so some of this is about how you ensure that some of the, the, the lowest paid workers can get um, training, who are often the least likely to get training, even though actually there may be those, those whose jobs are at most at risk from changing or from being replaced by um, technology. And so some of the things we looked at is just statutory training pay, making it possible for people to be able to afford to take up courses. I think the, um, I mean, uh, we Paul's talked about the Union Learning Fund, the value of the Union Learning Fund is that it was a, a, an accessible way for people to be able to get training and find access to training and to courses in the workplace and, and also to see it to be linked to, to work and to see the purpose from doing it. So 
our recommendation isn't just that it shouldn't be abolished, which is just a completely mad thing to do. It's also that it should be expanded. We should actually be using it far more than we are in terms of reaching a lot of people in the workplace already. We had other proposals around um, uh, uh, time off to learn and also um, about um, things like having employers actually having a responsibility to do skills reviews and to do plans because in the end we do need employers to take much greater responsibility for thinking about the skills needs of the future and the skills needs of their own workforce but also what's going to happen to those work that workforce over time as jobs change as well so that uh, some of the, the things when we talked about having these sectoral plans, the, the sort of sectoral partnership approach and industrial policy between employers and trade unions and the government, we're seeing training and skills as uh, should be at the heart of that um, and should be a really important part of it. And then just as a sort of final example, one of the reasons we've also talked about devolution to give local government, local partnerships the ability to do this We've been drawing up our um, proposals for Castleford for the Towns Fund, which is something we've been lobbying for for a long time, was to have that investment for towns. But as includes a new skills centre, a new skills hub, drawn up in partnership with the Castleford Tigers Foundation, which is you know the local rugby league team, which has huge support across the community and is a great way of bringing people into learning and training who might otherwise not think it's for them. And so finding different ways to support training through loads of different routes rather than thinking this is a one-size-fits-all. Great. Do any of the other commissioners want to come in on this round, that particular focus on skills? Sue? And then I'll ask Roy. <laughs> Everyone does, that's fine. Um, well, just a, a few thoughts to supplement what colleagues have already said. Um, and I agree there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. I think actually when we look at um, industrial policy uh, and the, we have already seen the rise of data and digital skills, for example. And it is true in some sectors uh, that employers are going to need to recruit from a wider base in order to fulfill those skills needs. And that's something that should be addressed within sectoral bodies because that does increase the opportunities for recruiting from a more diverse and wider pool. So I think that's important. I think where in sectors where government or local government is procuring skills or services, there is the opportunity to go back to what is not a new idea, but uh, requiring uh, rules in, uh, related to procurement and contracts. Um, and we have to be clear that this has to be a flexible mode of delivery. A lot of people uh, are not in a position to go back into full-time educational training, nor would they want to do that. So it has to be very much led by the circumstances uh, that people find themselves in. And uh, we can only just reflect on the decimation to the, of the resources of further education colleges, for example, which can be very good and flexible uh, providers for worker skills. But I think the key thing that we learn um, from international experience uh, is that to do this, it works best if you plan ahead and if you sit down with everybody around that table. So what, what I think we've done uh, in the UK is by and large responsive when, when these trends hit us and where we need to be is thinking ahead, planning and implementing the uh, requirements, the resources, the infrastructure uh, in anticipation of skills needs. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and I'll bring in Roy and Katie, if you could both just make very brief remarks. I'll get back to the, the panel and the questioners. Yeah, Roy. very, very briefly. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, think I, said, I, I think I said in my opening remarks that this is probably the most important uh, or one of the most important issues that we've got to address. When you look at the, what is it, 80% of the, the workforce that's going to be uh, with us in 2030 are already here. So this issue of lifelong learning is... Is, is, is massive and we've got to get to this point where people feel they can be you know picking up new skills constantly and being upskilled etc and I think the role there for the unions to play is to try and uh, you know get this on, on, on the uh, on the agenda more with employers employers do need to step up but so do we as, as unions in terms of opening up that agenda and having those discussions so it's, I think we are now 
I think we're more akin to having those type of discussions, whereas in the past, we probably thought training and upskilling, that was something the employer did. We, we, we didn't get involved with it. And I think we have to now, and we have to take the ball by the horn, so to speak, take it to the employer and say, we, this is part of our collective bargaining agenda. Thanks, Roy. And Katie, everyone else has dodged the question about the jobs of the future. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to dodge, dodge that one. I was going to dodge that one too, but probably can't. So just to answer that one first, I think in terms of the jobs of the future, I think honestly, who knows? But actually, the thing that you need to know and the thing that I was going to go on and talk about is we've talked a lot about what needs to happen systemically to support skills and training throughout life. But I think we often don't talk about what needs to happen culturally to support skills and training. And I think, you know, when we set out doing digital garages in local towns and cities, we wanted people to spontaneously come through the door and say, I'm here and I'd like to be trained. And actually, you know, life doesn't work like that. People are busy, they're working hard, they've got their family, they don't really, you know, they haven't done any skills or training since they left school. So I think in terms of jobs of the future, the key to being successful, I think, is being interested and knowing that throughout your life, you might have two or three or four careers and you will have to be constantly learning and evolving and changing. So that's my answer on jobs of the future. On skills and training, I think that we should think about the cultural element that's needed too. And I think the um, example Yvette gave in Castleford is really interesting. You know, we were sometimes on the high street, we were sometimes in libraries, we were sometimes in partnership with local organisations because we needed all of those networks to make people think, ah, oh, training is for me at this point, I'm going to prioritise it over everything else in my life and I'm going to take part. And yes, it needs to be free and I need, you know, time to attend. So I think let's think about how through all of our organisations we can also make you know a will to retrain and keep learning something that's culturally exciting for people because often it's it's really difficult when you have a noisy competing life that keeps you busy it's interesting that um a lot of the questions uh, are focusing on the training side of the report and emily wallace is the next one who wants to ask something related to this emily hi yes and just, just picking up on um actually um if that sort of briefly touched on it but maybe thinking specifically about where businesses are making redundancies um i'm kind of interested in where responsibility for retraining and reskilling should be and i really really believe that business should should be, we ought to have a culture whereby businesses believe that they take responsibility for their employees and keeping them their skills employable throughout their time with them and that if they're going to make them redundant that it's their responsibility to make sure that they have skills that are in demand in their local labour market and that that's part of their commitment to their employee when they you know first take them on so I, I guess it's covering both things really culturally how do we make that part of the kind of employer culture and also specifically around redundancies where where do we think responsibility should lie for retraining and reskilling Thanks, Emily. Um, and now I want a question to Simon Greaves. Simon, you've got a slightly different question. Simon, can you? That doesn't seem to be working. Last chance, Simon, otherwise I'm going to read your question for you because it's a very good one. So Simon says, um, a great piece of work. Um, and then I'm not just reading out the compliments. Then he says, in Bassett Law, we see a huge expansion in logistics. Um, I fear those same jobs will be removed in less than 10 years. And this is an issue that uh, the report flags, particularly with the growth of logistics this year. Um, huge potential in supporting employees and securing the new jobs that will be much needed to support the factories and logistics facilities of the future. So I think the question there is what what's the prospects for those growth industries of big logistics warehouse jobs that have grown so much but could be imperiled in the future. Um, and then I was going to go to one more question in this round, um, and that is uh, Joanne Alston. So Joanne, I'll just bring you in. Uh, Are you okay to speak, Joanne? Brilliant, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just have two questions on other countries. Um, firstly, are there countries which are doing much better than us in ensuring that workers are empowered in the whole process of automation? Um, 
And, um, and secondly, I just wondered whether the Commission is planning to engage with poorer countries, um, which are investing in manufacturing and aiming to bring in more technology so that they can um, maybe set about things in a, in a more effective way. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Um, right, where should we start? Which of our commissioners would like to kick off this time? Uh, uh, Margaret. Yes, I wanted to, to respond to Emily's question and, and also going back to, uh, to an aspect of the one that Harriet asked earlier about responsibilities of employers. Um, I mean, I think that this is one of the important things that we're emphasizing in, in the report, uh, new requirements and, and uh, uh, placed on employers. Um, but I also think that in a way the, the kind of pace of change that's happening at the moment um, actually means that employers are recognizing um, that they do better um, by uh, training and retraining their, their own workforce, the people that they already employ, um, than, than uh, looking outside because there just aren't always people there who have the particular new skills um, that, that employers are looking for. So I think there really are some opportunities here um, for, for uh, both the people who start, as Harriet was talking about, uh, um, with nothing, that employers will see that young people um, with the potential to learn um, are a good prospect uh, that they can take on and, and, and help them develop the skills that they need, but also for retraining people rather than making them redundant. But on the point about uh, redundancy and unemployment, I just wanted to uh, point to the, the recommendation in the report about a new role for Job Centre Plus, um, so that uh, job centres are not just about um, uh, uh, finding people, getting people into jobs quickly, but about uh, about helping people to get the right training to enable them to find jobs that will be good for them in the future. Great. Um, Paul, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Just quickly in response to uh, Emily and, and Joanne's point. I mean, uh, Emily, I, th I think quite like, rightly talked about employers' responsibilities as they're making people redundant, but also I think hinted that sort of the a wider problem, which is just a lack of employer investments in training in the UK in particular. I mean, I think the, the report pulls out the st st statistic that you now employers spend around about half the EU average on vocational training in the UK. I'm a little bit less optimistic, I think, than... The Margaret, uh, yes, there are some employers who have always seen the value of investing in training and skills. There is far too many, a, a big tail of employers in the UK who just don't see it as their responsibility. And I get fed up of going to roundtable events where where employers bemoan the quality of people leaving our schools and colleges and think that somehow it's a responsibility of institutions to deliver them work as ready made, not just for the skills needs of today, but the skills needs of tomorrow. And actually, it is about employers taking responsibility as well. And I think that's why it's important to report uh, places that renewed uh, focus on on employers and it feeds a little bit into uh, Joanne's question because I don't think there's any perfect country I mean the one that we often look to in the trade union movement is what uh, the arrangements they have in Germany where there's a much more embedded approach to social partnership collective bargaining is much more the norm across large parts of the economy but the you know the industry 4.0 commission that was set up by the German government precisely thinking about what are the big challenges facing the German economy, the opportunities presented by new technology, and how do you bring employers and unions and others together to meet those collectively, I think is, is important. As is put in a, a focus on, on, on quality of employment, and again, we pick up this in the report, but one of the concerns I have now, particularly uh, in the face of COVID-19, but also Brexit coming down the track um, and the end of the transition period, is that we go back into the bad old mantra of any jobs better than no job. And actually, I think one of the things we wanted to do as a commission was put focus on quality of employment because you know, ultimately these things are all linked, aren't they? Training and skills, quality of employment, you know, who benefits from new technology. So um, I don't think there's any perfect model, but the, those those examples and the OECD has drawn, you know, pulled this out where, where employees engage with unions and their workforce much more likely to have better outcomes, I think. Great. Ty uh, tiny number of questions and then I'm going to go back to the panelists to make final remarks. Sorry panelists who still want to come in, I just want to bring in one or two more questioners. So first of all, uh, Robert Guthrie. Hi Robert. Hi. Try again Robert. 
Is that better? Yep, go ahead. All right, okay. So uh, I think we've, I was interested or, or like to understand what sort of policies we can sort of, um, we can look to, to help people that haven't got the technology to sort of partake in some of the free uh, and, 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 and online courses and, and some of the training that is available. I, I was interested in looking at um, how we skill up people from a, from a pull perspective rather than a push perspective uh, uh, and what we can do to facilitate that. Because uh, we've got people uh, that are sharing laptops for school uh, and, and, and tablets for schoolwork. Uh, so <clears throat> having them retrain is going to be is going to be difficult. Great, thanks, Robert. And then I'm going to take one more question, and then back to the panel for final closing thoughts. And that's uh, Trevor Hills. Trevor, can you? Okay, can you hear me now? Go ahead, Trevor. That's brilliant. Yes. Um... The report refers a lot to the term employees, but it doesn't seem to say much from my brief reading of the crucial role of skilled quality management. After all, management generally employs and deploys workers into jobs and also plays a key role in the a pivotal role in operating the reciprocal employment relationship bargain. And that would involve trade unions where they are recognized, of course. So my question was, to what extent does the report relate to the reality of the key interaction of management with technology and with workers, which combined are producers of value and wealth that generate more and better quality jobs? Thank, thanks, Trevor. So uh, another great couple of questions, but I know we haven't fully addressed all the ones we've had throughout the session. So if I could ask each of our commissioners just to pick up uh, those last two questions or any of the others we've had and make um, a closing remark as well. Let me start with Katie. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think just picking up the question before Trevor's around, you know, how do we make this work when it's so difficult? And I think access to hardware is really important. Access to data and connectivity, you know, are you paying your really expensive broadband bill or have you run out of mobile data? You know, libraries are increasingly difficult to get to. Um, what I would guard against is a council of despair. Like there's lots of barriers in between a, a stress busy worker and their ability to learn and retrain. But there's lots of opportunities. You know, online does make it more easy uh, than ever before with, within those boundaries. Um, and so I would urge all of us who work, you know, with workers and, and with others to think about what resources already exist that we can harness. Um, and we've worked for many years with the Good Things Foundation that particularly um, do basic skills training with excluded members of the community. Um, and, you know, we ourselves put lots of courses online which are free of charge to use. So I think it's about finding what's right for your audience understanding what's already available using that and then pushing for more as it's needed and that can be connectivity that can be more in-depth um, resources but I think it's you know now is the time for us to do as much as we can with what's already available. Great thanks Katie. Paul. Hi Paul. Yeah yeah, yeah. I, well, well just maybe to pick up um, uh, Trevor's Trevor's point because I think it's a fair challenge. And I don't think in the report uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong. We refer ex explicitly to the the capacity of UK management, but we know that just as um, UK companies have a uh, a poor track record when it comes to investing in workforce development and skills generally, there's a particular issue around the quality of UK management. That said, I think the report does make a recommendation which is about combining support for employers around innovation, business development productivity, technology adoption and workforce engagement, all of these things, which I think would speak to that point uh, about management. And I think you know, the reality is there isn't one silver bullet is there that's going to get UK employers in a better position to adopt and use and deploy new technologies. It is going to be about support on all these different levels uh, and fronts. And as part of that, definitely, I think something explicitly focused on you know, the, the, the capacity of UK managers um, it, it is really important. So, so um, yeah, so I, I'll end on the management side of the fence, which is not normal for me, Andrew, but uh, probably not much more to add. Thanks. Um, Margaret. 
Um, maybe, yes, on management as, as well. I mean, uh, 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 it's probably true that there isn't such a focus in the report on that. But it does strike me thinking about it that the all of the uh, uh, good examples we saw uh, of, uh, um, of successful uh, implementation of, of new technology and adaptation were all examples where the management really had worked together uh, <coughs> who were operating the technology. So, for example, at Zurich Insurance, where um, they were asking the, the, the people who actually did the work of, of, of uh, filling in insurance claims uh, to map the work that they were doing in order to help adapt the jobs and find ways of, of doing them better. Um, and you know, in Siemens Congleton, it was the management working with workers to design their workplaces. So the successful examples all were examples where the uh, management had been listening to and learning from uh, the workforce. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, I really recommend you look at the case study boxes uh, in the report. There are some, I mean, it really brings this, this whole discussion to life. Um, Sue. Yeah, thank you. First of all, on the question of um, access for uh, poorer communities, I agree with what, what Katie said. Uh, I think a couple of things to add to that. Um, we shouldn't ignore the fact that access online can be positive for people who are in poorer circumstances, certainly allows for more flexible timing and approaches to learning for people who have a range of other responsibilities in their lives. Having said that, it is clear that people do struggle sometimes for access to resources. And I think actually this is where employers could step up a bit because there are very few workplaces that don't have such resources, but do they make them available to their workers for, for these purposes? And I think they could do that, uh, many of them very easily, and that they should do it. Um, in relation to the point about managers, um, I think the issue about the quality of UK management has been long and uh, well debated. I would just say, perhaps in mitigation, that mine is a union that represents a lot of people in management positions, that line managers are themselves often under a lot of pressure to deliver to cost and to time, which means that they are in some ways reflecting the values at the top of their organisation about what matters and what, what they should uh, invest their time in. Um, and we do say in the report uh, that you know, there is evidence to show that where managers consult with their workforce, uh, not only does it improve the experience of work, but it also improves something we haven't talked about this afternoon, and that is about productivity. So this is not all about cost, it's also about benefit. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Roy, uh, you've been instrumental in making this commission happen, uh, really keen to hear your final thoughts. Well, I think final thoughts was the report for us was it's a starting point to stimulate uh, the type of debate we've had this afternoon and we, which we need now to carry forward and have with uh, with all stakeholders. Um, it can't be looked in isolation or been looked at in isolation. I think Paul mentioned earlier something that, that we uh, certainly as affiliates the TUC are very keen to to have an influence in and that is an, an industrial strategy. We saw an industrial strategy launched in 2017 under Theresa May. Um, the, the pillars of that industrial strategy were, were more or less a lot of what we've talked about today. They were about people, it's about skills, it's about places, local development plans, regional, I'm old enough, probably a few people on the call to remember the old regional development agencies, that, that type of thing. So what we've seen was that that industrial strategy launched in 2017, it's, 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 it's already gone, it's like, I don't know, it's already outdated and it's now that the government are gonna embark on a review of that. We desperately want to see what that review looks like and, and as trade unions, we want to be involved, we want to have an influence and we want to be able to put our uh, thoughts uh, forward on that industrial strategy because that is gonna be a vital sort of piece of work to, to, to deal with some of the issues that we've talked about today. And very, very finally, I did want to come in on the, on the skills issue about, um, somebody mentioned about redundancies and where people are losing their jobs, responsibilities of employer. 
I'm a bit like Paul in this regard. My experience as a trade union official for many years is not a positive experience. Generally speaking, employers will, will invest and will train people for job specific skills. The minute you start to talk to them about transferable skills, that's about making their employers you know, more, more capable of, of finding a new job in the event of redundancy. Normally, not every time, there's always the exception, the barriers come down, the shutters go up, and they, and they don't want to talk about that type of investment because to them, that's not an investment that they are going to see a return on. So there is, you know, it's a problem, and I don't think it'll be solved by discussion. It'll need government to step in and, and create an environment where employers will do that. Thanks, Roy. And uh, last words to our Commission Chair, Yvette Cooper. Thanks, Andy. Well, I think just um, really to thank everybody again, thank you particularly to the commissioners and to everybody that's um, put this together. Um, and also I think to, to the Fabians and community for having seen the importance of looking forward and looking not just at the immediate challenges on our doorstep, which we're all aware of and have been so distracting and so difficult and challenging this year, but also actually at the challenges to come and us not just being passive in this, not just standing back and waiting for inequality to grow, waiting for us to just fall behind as a country because we don't invest in a positive way in the new technology we need and we don't involve working people in those technology decisions. We don't make the most of the skills of the workforce. We don't make the most of the organisations, the talent and the ability that we have. And instead, particularly, we let the lowest paid workers down. We leave behind the communities that have leased when actually they have huge potential to get on and there is a role for everybody in this the role for employers the huge culture change that we need among employers the role for trade unions the role for individuals for communities the role for local government and organizations and crucially the role for government who need to play the leadership role in shaping this and in bringing people together the kinds of partnerships the sorts of social partnerships that we've advocated as part of this report but that drawing on the talent and the potential of everybody to do it and we do say in the report we're at a crossroads we stand back we will just see inequality widen we will just see the worst of of the consequences of accelerating technology where some people benefit and other people really don't and that's not fair or we could actually set out a positive future where we have a plan and a commitment to bring people together to actually make the most of the new technology but make sure crucially that everybody can be part of it and final thought I would just finish on which is in some ways, the COVID crisis has been the really bleak backdrop to all of this and makes so many things harder. But the way in which people have responded to the COVID crisis with all kinds of innovation and determination and so on, whether that is people supporting others in their own local community, right through to all kinds of technology changes also shows what can be done and the big radical changes that we can bring if we put our minds to it. The fact that there are people walking into local clinics and local community centres to have a vaccine this week for a disease, for a virus that none of us even knew existed 12 months ago is an amazing testimony to the power of science, the power of technological developments, but also the determination of people to use science and technology to change things and shows what we can do when we try. And so I think that should be our reason to be determined and we'll be optimistic if we are determined. And, you know, the final tribute to both to Roy and to Andy and to their organisations for wanting to keep this work going and to take it forward, not to just say, OK, we did a report, we printed it, that's it done, but to say, actually, these are recommendations we're going to keep advocating, we're going to keep pursuing, because we know we can deliver amazing changes if we try. Thank you. Thanks, Yvette, and thanks to all our commissioners on the call. Thanks to the fantastic staff teams uh, at Community and the Fabian Society for all their hard work on the project. And very grateful to all of you for joining us on this uh, launch event uh, this evening. Thanks for your interest and participation. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.